Greetings, everybody. Hello out there, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C 2013 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Illumiter Networks, and our guest presenter is Mitra Ardrin. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I'm a senior program manager in the Engineering for Global Development Department. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, exploring challenges and misconceptions in scaling energy access in developing countries. Energy is one of E4C's focus areas, and we're particularly concerned with capturing and sharing lessons learned in this arena. So we're especially glad to have the opportunity to address both the challenges and misconceptions in this field today. To do so, we've invited today's presenter, Mitra, who is the CEO of Lumiter Networks, to talk about some of the work that his organization has been doing and the lessons they've learned. Mitra, we thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Um, amongst myself, we also have Holly Schneider-Brown, Victoria Chung, and Alex Torres of IEEE who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out in the audience has questions about the series, please be encouraged to contact any of us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Oops, there you go. Before we hand things over to our presenter today, we thought it would be a great idea to remind you about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a global community of now almost 13,000 technically minded individuals, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas faced around the world today. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as Engineers Without Borders USA, IEEE, ASCE, um, Society of Women Engineers, ASHRAE, and academic supporters like MIT's D-Lab, Stanford's D-School, as well as international development agencies such as USAID, Practical Action, and a number of others. Additionally, we provide access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring leading edge technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information of upcoming installments in the series, as well as archive videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage. Uh, you see the URL right there, engineeringforchange-webinars.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. Additionally, if you're on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join the conversation with us. Uh, we are at Engineer for Change and with the hashtag uh, hash E4C webinars. E4C's next webinar will be on March 13th at 11 a.m. EST with Daniel Zurfik who is the CEO of WeCare, on the subject of a responsible design approach to the development of global medical devices. To register, we invite you to visit the E4C webinars page. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we see the number of participants going up, and we'd love to see where everyone is from today. In the chat window, which is immediately to the right of the screen here, please type your location. I'll start with by giving you all an example. There we go. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go in the chat window. Feel free to send a private chat to Holly or myself if you have additional questions. Looks like we have folks from all over so far the US and Canada. We'll see if we have any folks from abroad. We generally do. 
You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have during the webinar. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat window to type in your questions for the presenter. That way we can keep uh, track of all of the questions that are coming in. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting the stop and then the start button. If that does not work, you can use the call-in number in the tele for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening WebEx in a different browser. Oh, we have some folks from Saudi Arabia, some folks from the UK, and all over the US. Fantastic. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for those of you who need this for your professional engineering license, please provide your full name and date you completed this webinar, as well as the code that we will give you at the end of the session, uh, and send all of this information to eab-ceu admin at ieee.org. Many more coming in here. Wow. It's so good to have you all here. So today's presenter would like to introduce you to Mitra. Uh, Mitra is the CEO of Luminar Networks, and prior to that, he was the executive director of naturalinnovation.org, which mentored and supported clean tech innovation for developing countries. In the past, he has run a solar photovoltaic company that pioneered community purchase of solar in Australia and co-founded the Association for Progressive Communication, which pioneered the internet into much of the developing world. We, he is what we like to call a serial entrepreneur, and we are very pleased to have him. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mitra to take us through his presentation. Hi, hello everybody. Um, let me see if I figure out how to advance the slides. Ollie, give me a clue. Advance the slides. Okay. Feature, you're just going to use. The, there you go. I got it. Yeah. Hi. For me, Hina, like one and a half billion other people, she studies by the light of a kerosene lamp. It stings her eyes, and it contributes to the continuous cough that her mother has. Two million deaths occur from such respiratory problems each year. Hina keeps back from the lamp as her brother was severely burned last year when one knocked over. He was lucky. Two and a half million other Indians were severely burned last year and 300,000 died worldwide. Lack of electricity in the home impacts every aspect of Hina's life. The ability for her parents to use their mobile phone, her studying, treating water and so on. While renewable energy alternatives exist, such as solar lamps, solar home systems, four wind turbines, etc. Her family doesn't have the savings to buy these kind of systems, and they don't qualify for a loan. Her school has power, but they won't sell the power to the village for some reason. In today's webinar, we'll look at some of the myths and misconceptions that drive the availability or non-availability of power to people like Hina, and explore some of the solutions and finish with a bit more detailed look at Lunita's approach to the problem. Um, I see a message that I'm not speaking loud enough. Can you hear me now? Okay, Holly? Okay, looks like it's better. Okay, so myth number one, you just need to invest in centralized infrastructure and extend the grid to everybody. Well, as anyone who's been in the developing world knows, existing electricity grids are often really poor. And they've evolved to solve industry who can afford to buy politicians and not to serve the poor. We all saw the headlines when 680 million people lost power in India. But what we don't hear about is that 400 million aren't connected to the grid at all. And that many, if not most of the rest, can't rely on the grid. For example, in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, the power is out roughly 20% of the time. The 20% outage, from what I've heard, seems to be better than most of the conditions experienced by most of the people I know. And everyone steals from the grid anyway. In some places, as much as 50% of the power is stolen. And this rampant theft has become a barrier to grid extension. After all, what's the incentive to extend power into an area where much of it will be stolen? The International Energy Agency, or IEA, estimates we need $48 billion per year to be invested to bring modern energy to the remaining 1.4 billion people by 2030. That sounds a, a, a lot. But really, it's only 3% of global energy investment over that same period. Most significantly for, for us, 
the IEA sees 20% of this number being served by off-grid sources and 38% by mini-grids. This is stunning when you consider that the IAE is the most conservative international energy body. and It's been dominated by fossil fuel and nuclear lobbies. Tamil Nadu has one of the highest rates of electrification in India, but their existing grid is so poor that most rural places are essentially off-grid for much of the day. I couldn't find a quote, but the Tamil Nadu go government has supposedly said that those not reached by the grid never will be. It is already cheaper to install renewable energy than to extend the grid. The Peruvian government has also estimated there are 300,000 rural households that cannot be reached by extending the grid. So what's the alternative to extending the grid? Distributed renewables are the obvious choice. They don't rely on concerted, unworkable, multi-decade plans. They can and are being implemented by many independent actors, by governments, companies, NGOs, or villages themselves. In Bangladesh, for example, 30,000 solar home systems are being installed every month. The second myth is that the problem is rampant corruption among developing world governments who misallocate funds structure and establish draconian bureaucracies that make entering the market prohibitively challenging and expensive. Well, some, or maybe all of that is true. Um, but although much centralized funding is misappropriated, that number is highly variable even within countries. For example, in India, it's estimated that in Bihar, up to 80% of aid is misappropriated. But this number is far, far lower in some other states, especially in Kerala. Bureaucracy is also a major implement to doing business. And bureaucracy and corruption are tightly linked. Because without a cumbersome bureaucracy that only knows how to say no, there'd be no incentive to pay bribes to speed things up. Some specific sorts of bureaucracy are critical barriers. For example, if there's an import tariff, it's going to slow things down or make them uneconomical. But of course, we should note that's not limited to developing countries. In October, the US, supposedly the bastion of free trade, imposed a tariff of between 24 and 36 percent on solar panels to protect its own uncompetitive manufacturers. The other barrier is regulation. If a government imposes Western standards, then it can prevent cost-effective implementation. If it imposes a pricing structure that's below cost, for example, enforcing a tariff of grid parity, then the grid itself is subsidized, but the supposed subsidized subsidies for renewables aren't accessible without the right political connections, then this is going to stop the, the potential solutions and leave people paying as much as $5 per kilowatt hour for alternative energy sources, such as kerosene, candles, and, and battery or phone charging services. In reality, nimble entrepreneurs can bypass much of this corruption by introducing market-based solutions not dependent on government largesse or on the government's honesty or competence. It was hard to find an energy image that matches this concept, but we've seen this transition happen in finance already. And of course, it's much harder to misappropriate funds that a village is spending on their own energy than funds that are spent by a donor through a government onto a, a centralized grid that may never deliver the power to the intended recipients. Customers are already willing to buy services. And if you're paying $5 per kilowatt hour for um, alternatives, for candles or kerosene or whatever, um, the, even the high cost of renewables are well worth it. Um, suppliers have just got to work out how to meet that demand and how to deliver affordable services despite the corruption and regulation. Myth number three, of course, is that we don't have the renewable technology uh, to, to affordably deliver electricity to poor people in the developing world. So we've got to stick with noisy, expensive, polluting diesel generators or wait for the next generation of solar or the extension of the grid. Certainly, there's new technology coming. But clean tech is like computers, except it's on a slower version of Moore's law. There's always something better, cheaper, or cleaner coming. But that doesn't give us a reason not to start now using what's available. Because in reality, cost-effective technology solutions already exist. They exist even for low-income people, and they're being deployed globally today. Centralized large-scale coal, of course, is a lot cheaper than small-scale renewables. But its price is ignoring the cost and viability of extending the grid, the externalities from mining, from water usage, and from greenhouse gas emissions. 
Unfortunately, in many countries, both developing and developed, the coal industry is big enough to own politicians, so those costs never make their way to the consumer. Comparable electricity costs are measured with a value called levelized cost of electricity, or LCOE for short, which takes account of the capital, the operational and maintenance costs, and the different value of both power and expenses now versus those being delivered or expended in the future. Diesel's LCOE is typically around 50 cents per kilowatt hour, depending mostly on the cost and availability of fuel and how much it's taxed. With a really small scale 500 watt wind project we've been looking at in Peru, we're seeing similar LCOEs. This comparison is done at today's prices, of course, and as oil becomes scarcer, it's estimated that diesel would increase in cost by 30% over the next 20 years, while solar wind, and most importantly the cost of replacing batteries, is falling rapidly. Most importantly, both PV and wind are already implementable on a scale that matches the financial ability of people to, to pay. For example, spending a, uh, about $2 a week, which is enough, even at 50 cents a kilowatt hour, to purchase about 4 kilowatt hours. But that doesn't sound like much in Western terms, except that those homes are being installed with typically 2.5 watt lights and maybe a 40 watt TV or room fan. So 4 kilowatt hours goes a long way. Myth number four. Let's just raise some money and go to some place we've never heard of, put solar panels on a school, or build a water system, or something else. It's a great, it's a great idea. The trouble is it doesn't scale. And don't, don't misunderstand me. These programs <coughs> are a great form of cultural exchange and a great way for people to learn a bit about the culture. But the programs have far more impact on the volunteers than on the host countries. They do more, almost nothing for solving energy or water or other infrastructure problems in the destination because they're very limited in scale. The scale is what really matters here. Most programs have at most installed a dozen or so installations where tens of thousands are needed. And very few of these programs, if any, have built the capacity for local organizations to continue that work or to expand it beyond the villages where they're working. In fact, in many cases, they can cause more harm than good and disrupt the potential for a local business because they create an expectation of a free installation and encourage people to wait for the next pack of volunteers to provide free power for their school. Um, a colleague of mine was working in Haiti once, and he was um, trying to teach people how to build their own houses. And their general response was, well, why should we build our own house? Why should we learn to build our own house when some NGO is going to come in and build a brick house? And they looked at the next village where um, a missionary charity had spent money after the hurricane uh, and, and, and rebuilt brick houses. And they were just waiting for the next brick house to come along. I'll be happy to talk more about this um, in, the, in the question time. There's a related myth, of course, that all you need is do-it-yourself training and education and you'll solve your own problems. I'm sure you've seen this image before. I noticed it at the beginning of the seminar in the E4C heading. Um, it comes from the book The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, the incredible story of William Kamkwamba from Malawi, who taught himself science and built a windmill. So why can't everyone do this? I mean, can you see in that image what the scarcest component is? Of course, it's the, quote, boy, the, i.e., someone with the intelligence of William who's still living in their village and hasn't migrated to the city to seek education and fortune. William, of course, the, the guy shown in the picture, is now at Dartmouth. And I understand his wind generator hasn't even been replicated in his or the neighboring villages. Now, obviously, this shouldn't be taken as a critique of William's abilities, because he's really stepped out of what, what, he's, you know, what he was expected of him. But it does point to the challenge of scaling, because most of the do-it-yourself videos we find, like the Instructables, simply don't work in practice, because the materials needed aren't available locally. And training people to the level of inventive, inventiveness needed to improvise for whatever is available is itself expensive. And what appears to be free usually isn't. We were supporting a project in India that was using old wheel bearings for something. Now, the first time they visited the dump, the wheel bearings were free. The second time they went, the wheel bearings had a price. And the third time, there weren't any usable ones left. Somebody had figured out that if the bearings were desired, they must have a value. And if they had a value, they got a price, and they could find somewhere else to sell them. 
Training itself, of course, costs money and skilled people. In most cases, training people village by village is neither affordable nor scalable. <coughs> there are nuances, of course, to this. If we look, for example, at Barefoot College's scheme, which trains Ill illiterate grandmothers to be solar engineers, it sounds like a great idea. And in fact, in many ways, it is. Building capacity locally is a great idea. But on another, some of the methods used might not end up bringing affordable solutions, even if they build that local capacity. For example, I've heard that in their solar lamp program, and I, and I haven't been able to obtain figures, so I'd like to get confirmation of this from someone, that the lower level components, i.e. the LEDs, the batteries, etc., cetera, um, that they're importing and that, that they make into the solar lamps actually cost them more than the cost of importing high quality solar lamps, and that the quality of the lamps, because they're handmade, is actually significantly less than quality brands such as the unrelated Barefoot Power, Greenlight Planet, but because of the economies in the scale and because of their autom automation, can achieve higher qualities at lower prices. So is training, is, is training Barefoot engineers for that level of skill useful, or do we need to be focusing our energy on training really competent engineers who can tackle the problems that aren't best done with automation and mass production? The reality, of course, is, as I say, that we need capacity building at that scale. And it takes many forms. There are, there are good programs here in the US, like Green Empowerment, or um, Engineering Without Borders in Australia, that place engineers with local engineering companies who train and help solve problems. Help at that level can really create a lasting difference, especially since the relationships forged often lead to ongoing support. The images I'm showing here are from Mumbai, an organization in southern India that my nonprofit Natural Innovation was supporting. Mumbai trained village mechanics to build wind turbines. And its founder, Jorge's key insight was that if maintenance requires a day trip for a highly paid city engineer, then it's going to be unaffordable. And that, but that if you trained local maintenance people, then the cost of that training would never be recouped. So instead, Mumbai was training village mechanics to build and erect their own turbines. You notice he's training village mechanics who are already competent um, people who can work with anything. When, he was, when I was last visiting there, a couple of Nepali mechanics had come down. But their village is four hours work walk from the nearest road. Um, after they'd been trained, during the training, they built a, um, a turbine for themselves. And then they went on to build another one in the workshop after the training was over and returned home confident in their ability to build more turbines for all the villages near their homes. But even a program like this needs careful scrutiny. <coughs> when I crunched the numbers, we realized that while training to build the metal framework of the turbine and the tower and the training for the, for the siting and installation of the turbine made total financial sense, the extra cost of training a mechanic up to build the generator, which is prone to failure, and to carve the wooden blades, wasn't justified, and that to be financially viable for both Nimvayu and the trainees, what they should really be doing was making those components, the blades and the generators in regional facilities, probably be making the blades from fiberglass, something that was replicable and, and less prone to mistakes. So myth number six, why don't we just buy a huge number of solar lights and give them away, or develop a so-called buy one, give one program? After all, if it worked for shoes, why not for energy? Well, actually, it didn't work for shoes for several reasons. Giving away shoes distorts the local market. It creates a dependency on the donor. And most importantly, it puts the local shoemakers out of business. After all, there's very few places in the world where you can't find shoes. The problem is having the money to purchase them. And also, a program like that doesn't scale. It didn't for shoes, and it won't for solar lamps. Sooner or later, and usually sooner, you run out of donors, or you run out of Western customers or Western governments willing to subsidize the program. We have to find ways where stuff can be paid for by the people themselves. So distribution isn't into developing countries isn't easy, but supply chains already exist. They exist for soap, they exist for household goods, and they exist for energy. Lumita's renewable energy partners are already installing off-grid installations every day, as are many others. Distribution does, however, need realistic margins. For, uh, for example, at a conference in, in 2011, 
somebody showed a prototype LED light they'd made and boasted how it only cost $5 for the LEDs and batteries and how mounting them in a plastic pipe and commented on how much cheaper it was than solar lanterns. What, of course, they failed to consider was that something that costs $5 in components or $5 at the factory gate is going to clear customs in the country at about $10 and sell retail from a kiosk such as that above for about $20. Well, since solar lanterns, along with the panel, only cost $20 to $30, that's hardly an improvement. So what, of course, we need to do is focus on getting the cost down or making sure there are reasonable margins there and that we're selling a product that people really need. And, the, and the most importantly, that you've got the time and budget to convince people that what you have to sell has value and should command some of their very, very tight weekly budget. Myth number seven is really two competing myths. Either that there's no money made to be made serving the poor, or that there's a fortune to be made, um, as was made famous in, in C.K. Pollard's book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Both myths are harmful, because the former discourages investment in the entrepreneurship and creates a charity mentality, while the latter sets unrealistic expectations of a quick fortune. So what is the reality? in terms of numbers. If we assume five people per household, there are roughly 300 million households off-grid and without electricity today. It's a market that wants energy services and is willing to pay for them. In fact, they're already spending money. Typically, BOP households spend about $2 a week on energy, buying batteries, candles, kerosene, and recharging phones or batteries. This represents a $60 billion market. It's a very cautious market. If you're earning a dollar a day, you're going to be cautious about what you spend it on. And that money has to be collected roughly weekly, as most bottom of the pyramid households would find it hard to save up a month's energy payments. And they also don't have easy access to credit. Or if they do, it's if interest rates often are often around 20% or a lot. Of them. So the solutions need to be embedded in a business model that can work with these realities. Let's dig a little deeper into the barriers that our Peruvian partner, Windade, faced in scaling their offerings and bringing it to the BOP. The image on the left is a little hard to see, but it shows a wind turbine above a village. The secret is that the village gets no power from the turbine. The, the turbine feeds a school that's out of camera. The people of this village wanted to buy power, but our partner was unable to sell it to them because of the challenge of collecting $2 a week from each household and, of course, dealing with the inevitable problems of unwillingness or inability to pay, or of cutting people off who didn't pay. In the center, we see an installation on a ridge line in mountainous country. It's adjacent to a clinic, and the people in the picture have climbed steep paths carrying heavy lead-acid batteries to get them recharged. It would be technically easy to run cables down the mountain to the houses. However, once the cable was there, there'd be nothing to stop other houses from tapping into the cable and stealing power. On the right, we see a turbine at a seafood processing facility. Soon after it was installed, the neighbor asked if he could run a cable and light his shack. The price was agreed. What was one fish a day? The cable was run. But a week later, a second light appeared down at the beach where the fisherman beached his boat and worked on his nets. And soon after, at night, you could see the blue flickering light of the TV from the shack. But still, one fish a day was delivered as payment. Of course, in this case, the seafood, planner, the seafood plant owner um, had no way to measure, monitor, or control the amount of power delivered. In this case, it didn't matter. But when you scale that to over 100 houses, it starts to matter. Um, a similar story was told to me by um, someone in the Dominican Republic. They used, to, they used to have a, um, a group that would go through the village at night looking for incandescent bulbs, which they would break with a baseball bat, because if they didn't, the, the power from their hydro generator wouldn't supply the whole village. So this is where Lumita comes in. With Lumita's new meter, customers buy credits, or what we call luminates, in the same way that they buy mobile phone top-ups for their phones. Our back end tracks the payment, and it provides tokens that enable the meters and also handles all the complex payment processing. We've had in indications from large investors 
that de-risking the customer payment could free up project financing, which allows our partners to scale. The second problem our renewable partners face, as illustrated earlier, is electricity theft, which is rampant in developing countries. Our meters are designed to allow the development of temper-resistant microgrids at a variety of scales, from five to 500 houses and using whatever technology is appropriate, whether that's solar, wind, or biomass. Meter METER also incorporates a number of power management functions, allowing control of the amount of electricity supplied, either on a home-by-home -home basis or by groups of homes or for the, meter, the, the mini grid as a whole. Competitive products exist, of course, but they're typically vertically integrated, for example, into the solar system, and they apply to a whole systems approach rather than something that can be integrated into local partners' projects. We believe, and our partners are confirming, that the degree of flexibility we provide and our functionality is unique, especially at a price point affordable at the base of the pyramid. Our meter is, to a certain extent, both the power source and, and business model agnostic. In this image, we see one particular business model that could be applied. I should say this was intended to be an animation, but we weren't able to deliver the animation through the webinar. This example, the village entrepreneur, seen at the top in the middle, sees a need to electrify their village. They take a loan from a bank and, and use that loan to purchase a system from one of our renewable energy partners. The renewable energy partner uses the money to buy batteries, a solar panel, or micro hydro or turbine to hire local labor and to install a mini grid. One of Lumita's meters is installed at each house and another at the power source. In each village, we typically find a, shop, a storekeeper, shown in the middle on the left. They maintain a balance on an agent network. Usually they, use, they do that to uh, sell mobile phone minutes, for example. That storekeeper would send an SMS to Lumita via our in-country gateway. Lumita would check that balance with the agent network and create a token, which we send back to the agent and, and if we know the phone number to the customer. And I should say our, our systems do not depend on the customers having mobile phones or having mobile phone coverage where they live. When the customer enters the token on the meter, their lights will come on. Lumit dist distributes the money that we receive according to whatever the business model is, for example, to the bank, the village entrepreneur, and the renewable energy partner in this example. And of course, this is just one business model. There are several others, and each of our partners is exploring different ones. So in summary, how do Lumita and other projects approach the challenge of a scalable and affordable solution? First, we need to build on-ground on capacity and identify the capacity that already exists, capacity to install and, most importantly, maintain renewable energy systems. We've got some great partners lined up who already know how to deliver renewable energy in their own culture, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. But we're always interested in finding more partners. Then you need a, a viable business model. In our case, it's an affordable payment system enabled by our meter and cloud accounting. Then we need a growing financial investment pipeline to reach the kind of numbers we were talking earlier about in the IEA numbers. In our case, it's a source of loans that can finance the installation of systems to be paid back. And those systems will be paid back over several years, but with a very low level of risk because the meter is controlling that you can't access the energy without paying for it. Finally, we need the ability to, to build uh, community ownership or village entrepreneurs so that they can own and provide the power themselves because that is what will really bring a, a greater degree of certainty and create local employment opportunities. Of course, nothing is done by just one person. I want to finish by introducing and crediting our team. That's me with the built-in solar collector on my head. Um, I pioneered um, community solar purchase in Australia and spent the last two years before that before I co-founded Lumita, mentoring innovation for developing countries and seeking out um, innovators who had great ideas but were lacking the resources to complete them. Grant's focus in the middle at the top is on microfranchising for economic development. Um, before Lumita, he built a taxi microfinance in Peru. So microfranchise, not, not microfinance, in Peru. Jonah, our field engineer, is down in Peru at the moment. He's a systems and control engineer. He's lived and worked in several countries. Kat has an international development background, and she's helping us with market research. And Curtin down at the bottom are the engineering smarts from Meridian Design, who are behind a number of other BOP products, in particular focus on the frugal engineering and getting the cost down. 
So that's the, uh, the end of the, the, the webinar. It's gone a bit quicker than I expected. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer questions and uh, very happy to answer challenging questions on, the, uh, on some of what I think are the misconceptions. If you want more information about Lumiter, you can find it at www.lumiter.net or you can email me. You can also find more information about natural innovation at, at www.naturalinnovation.org. Thank you and back to you, Iana. Thank you, Mitra. That, that was incredible amount of information and, and beautiful imagery and lots to, front, uh, to learn from. So at this point, we're going to open up the floor to your questions. Um, we are not done. I, I see a lot of thank yous coming in, but uh, we do have now uh, a good amount of time to, to tackle any of the questions from the attendees. I invite you to type in your questions into the Q&A window that is below the chat window, um, anything that is, is burning right now. Um, while we wait uh, for folks to come in, I, I'd like to ask one question um, in terms of, of your, oh, actually, I do have one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop myself, hold my questions a little bit later, and tackle some of these coming from the audience. So question number one is, um, I, I believe it's a, uh, regarding the Lumiter network uh, and the Lumiter system, uh, what is the cost? Uh, is it less expensive than a pair of candles? Is that, I hope I've captured that correctly. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, cost has to be less than, I don't, I'm not to say just a pair of candles, but less than the, than the total energy budget that people are spending on lighting. So this is not really about the cost of Lumiter. It's about the cost of our supplier's energy. Um, the, we, we worked out that the, the, sorry, the, our supplier in that case was, was looking at trying to beat $5 a kilowatt hour, that is what people are paying for candles. So in the system in Peru, the customer is going to be paying less per day than they're currently spending on candles and kerosene or, and battery recharging for about twice as much light. So that's really their comparison. And, they, and, and they, in that process, they'll be paying off the, the system in about three or four years, and after which they'll own the system. Do we note it? Thank you. Uh, another question has come in. Do you see these off-grid villages having power soon, or do things like solar cookers and water purifies, purifiers still, uh, still, are they still necessary? Well, that's an interesting couple of questions because it, it, it also addresses, a, in a sense, a different myth in this space, right? Um, solar cookers have generally failed pretty much anywhere they've been tried. So efficient cookers, yes, because nobody sane will be generating electricity from the sun turning it, and then turning that into heat to cook with. So electricity for cooking makes no sense. So super efficient stoves are just as important as they ever have been. Although, as I said, solar cookers have always failed. Um, Water purifiers is a different question. Um, the question is what you're going to use to, to do that water purification. And most filtration systems have also been a problem because, which I could go into in detail, but everyone knows the problems with water filters. And um, probably the best solution to, to treating water is going to be UV treating at the, at the household scale because that can be done really, really cheap. Um, and that requires a small amount of electricity, uh, a typical Low cost, very low cost water purifier cost takes about four watts when it's running. Duly noted. All right, more questions coming in. Um, having local partners is so important for impact. How do you make initial connections with people in these countries? Well, we've been lucky because what Lumit is offering is so hard to find that we've had uh, local partners coming to find us. Um, there are in most countries between two and five organizations that really know what they're doing. And, and those are the kind of people that have been coming to us. And I'm, I'm off to, to Cambodia, to India, and to Zambia in the next few months to meet with partners who've approached us from there. So in terms of uh, kind of to pull a little bit on that thread, you mentioned that there's usually only a few uh, organizations, a handful of organizations that, that are really credible. How do you gauge credibility? Do you, do you, is there a kind of a quick and dirty analysis that you conduct in meeting new partners, potential partners, that is? Um, peer review is the most important thing. I mean, this, this sector is small enough that people know who are competent and who aren't. And, and you know, 
The competent partners are actually already delivering something in some form and are dealing with the actual mm -hmm. problems that they find locally. And we should say those partners can be either companies or they can be nonprofits. We're, we're agnostic about that. Fantastic. Uh, a question's come in regarding uh, support. Uh, the question is, can a first-year student do any type of internship to help these countries build their renewable energy systems? And would that help Lumiter or organizations such as Lumiter get the monitoring systems in place? Depends what they're the first-year uh, student in, really. Uh, and the, the, the challenge with any kind of program that sends students overseas is they're spending the, heart, the first chunk of the time they're there figuring out how to survive in that environment. Um, and so unless you're really taking skills to actually offer, it, it's, it's not clear what you can do in country. Now, I think there's lots of opportunities because a lot of people are missing, the, a lot of these organizations are missing the engineering skills. And I, I know I've been talking with a number of people about the potential for systems that actually match students with um, with projects that they can actually help on. And of course, Engineering for Change, I think, has been doing some of this. Um. We're certainly trying. <laughs> um, a question has come in regarding fundraising, fundraising by Lumiter. Um, someone's read somewhere that you're not interested in raising funding through Kickstarter. Uh, I guess they're interested in knowing wh why, why not, if that is the case. Um, well, the, the, the challenge with, there's several challenges with Kickstarter, right? Um, one of the challenges, of course, is Kickstarter is focused on gadgets. It loves things that are shiny that you can deliver as gifts. It's not very good with things that are complicated, that have a lot of moving parts, I mean, a lot of human moving parts rather than physical moving parts, and that are really complicated systems. So it's hard to get the concept across on something like Kickstarter. Also, Kickstarter hasn't until recently been very good at raising enough money to actually do the job. Um, either the money that, that Lumiter itself is raising for its own um, activities or, more importantly, for the kind of money that's actually going to be needed to deliver power. Now, we are talking to an, a couple of crowdfunding organizations about dedicated platforms um, that are looking at funding solar in-country. Uh, and, and I can't say who they are, but there's, you know, there's certainly opportunity for crowdfunding to, to provide the loans to the communities to, to um, install things. It's important there is their loans, so that money can then be reused. And the other issue with Kickstarter, of course, is there's no judgment factor on it. If it's shiny and, it, and it's got a, a good story, it gets funded with no real criteria. I mean, we saw, the, we saw for example, the gravity that light get funded. When you do the math, it's highly unlikely that's actually ever going to work. And that got a, a ridiculous amount of money because it was sexy and it was different. That's a very good point. Um, we have more questions coming in, Mitra, so you're, you're going to be here for the full hour. Get ready. One of the questions is uh, regarding these, um, oh, well, we, I think you already tackled the fact that Lumiter's partners are beyond not only NGOs, uh, but this question is regarding local community groups. Um, are you partnering with local community groups or solely with foreign NGOs? Um, we're not. It's not a question of foreign NGOs. I mean, our partners are usually locally based NGOs or companies. Mm. Um, right. We're not partnering directly with community groups because they don't usually have the ability to install the energy system. In a sense, you can say it's a partner because usually it's ourselves, or, or the situations we're looking at them in some of the cases, are ourselves a local en engineering company that knows how to build the turbines or the solar panels or whatever. And a local um, community organization who's going to own and operate the system. So that's the, that's the kind of partnering you need. We're not going to partner with people to try and teach them how to become electricians to build one system. Understood. Is there, uh, to relate to that, I suppose, in, in looking at, at human resources, uh, there's a question here about if there are programs like Engineers Without Borders or others out there that would be beneficial to look at in order to use uh, this particular individual's fabricating skills. So you're, you're talking about uh, the need for uh, folks that are already trained and, and have that technical basis or base of knowledge. Um, are there opportunities for additional training that you can recommend? Um, nothing that I can re recommend at the moment. I, I think there's a big gap there for somebody who's actually doing good matchmaking between people with the skills and the projects that need them. I'm, I'm going to keep it. having engineers asking me this question. So I send them to engineers, engineers 
um, for change and a couple of other places, but I'm still finding people are not, not finding it easier to match with um, the people who need those resources. And at the same point, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from um, all kinds of people doing innovations that they're having difficulty finding the engineering talent. So it's definitely a hole there for matchmaking. Yes, we've been uh, we've been doing uh, quite a bit of work in that space. For those of you who are on the webinar listening, if you are on Twitter, highly recommend that you follow our Twitter feed. We post jobs with a hashtag jobs. We also do, if you are, become a member of E4C, you will receive newsletters. One of the newsletter types is a roundup that includes all the posts that we see of jobs. And, and of course, for any of you representing organizations who are seeking engineering talent, please let us know if there are opportunities, whether they're for fellowships, internships, training, or paid jobs. And we will be happy to send it out to our entire network uh, via social media as well as our uh, direct membership. So that's certainly another way to get connected to opportunities. Uh, and th that actually feeds us really nicely into another question regarding this is how can working professionals help with eliminating energy poverty? So I don't know if you want to add anything else to, to what we've already said, uh, Mitra, or? I mean, I think I've said some of that. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you want to volunteer small amounts of time, then there's, there's trying to find that, I say, that matching that, that really matches your skills with what's needed. Um, and there are a couple of good programs. If you if you've got more time available, um, like if you want to make you know do a, a six month or a year program, there are companies that are doing a good job of this. And I say I particularly like Green Empowerment in the U.S. or Engineers Without Borders in Australia because I've seen both of those uh, working in the field and have people in the field say how how good those programs have been for them. Thank you. Uh, so a more technical question here uh, regarding your thoughts on turning fecal sludge into fuel. Is this something your team has thought about? No. I'm going to say we know people who are doing that. Um, um, there's, there's a couple of companies in India. Um, I forget his name because he keeps changing the name of his company um, in Delhi who's been looking at doing that. But that's not our. That's not our. But I think it's a great idea. The question is do the numbers work? And, and the thing is, as with most of these things, it comes down to do the numbers work. Something look, can look really cool as a, a lab experiment, um, but unless you can go and crunch the numbers and show that this is going to produce energy you know, at a cost per kilowatt hour and with a capital cost which is cheaper than any other source that they've got access to, then we're wasting our time. And in particular, whether you can do that at a point where it scales to reach you know, a million people. Uh, you know, so not just the cost of the, of the manufacture, but the cost of the distribution and, and the maintenance and the support and everything else. Once you go beyond just using the volunteer labor. So that's the real math, hard math that has to be done on any project. Um, and that's that, certainly, yeah, we're, yeah. Mm -hmm. go ahead. So, yeah, and I think this is one of the mistakes that's often made in the volunteer sector, is, is, is we look at doing something cool, but we forget that at the scale of the problem, if, if you, know, you build a biogas digester for one village, that's really not impacting the problem at all. Um, if you help an organization that is developing a biogas generator that is then going to, to deploy it in that country at, on, a, on a country scale, then you're potentially having impact. Right. So it's really important to do that economic analysis to determine whether the, the system is actually competitive with respect to the alternative options. Uh, something that engineers are well trained to do, and, and uh, I think it's a, it's a really, really valid and important point here uh, that you're sharing with us. Another question here, um, how do your partners typically produce energy? Is it mostly renewables like solar and wind, or are there groups who use more traditional fuels like coal or natural gas? Well, um, I mean, uh, technology, technologically, our system is power source agnostic. We haven't talked to anyone doing using traditional fuels. Um, we're not particularly interested in working in fossil fuels because, you know, if the if the developing world modernizes using coal or natural gas, it's game over in terms of the climate. Couldn't agree with you more. All right, so um, I think I've tackled most of the questions that have come in here. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions, please do put them in to the Q&A window. I'm checking our chat window here as well. Um, there, there is a comment uh, regarding, uh, I guess, the webinar here. It's noted very, that this webinar is very informative. However, there needs to be a more structured approach to the 
to organization comparable with finance and alternative varied systems. Um, I think certainly this conversation is multifaceted uh, with, with engineering and determining uh, both a technical solution as well as an approach and whether something is feasible or not. And perhaps that's speaking to a, a little bit of the gaps in, in terms of uh, training our, our technical individuals uh, for global development. But uh, perhaps maybe, make sure you can speak a little bit to uh, where folks uh, maybe can get a little bit more of this learning, if you, if you have any resources uh, that you know off offhand, or um, any particular insights, uh, reports. I know you mentioned uh, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, but if there are other um, publications that you, you think are particularly credible and, and provide that kind of insight, we'd love to hear about it. Well, I think that the, the best sources of information are the, the various online forums and places where people who are actually doing the work are talking. Um, I'm finding very little relevant to this space coming out of university studies or anything at this point. Um, what I am finding, because, because mostly the people who are actually doing on the ground missing to conferences, and they're not publishing papers. Um, but what they are doing is talking to each other. And, and those mm -hmm. are the places where I'm seeing the most learning happening. I, you know, I go to places like Luminade, or um, there's, a, there's a couple of practitioner-only networks. But there are some more public ones, I say, like Luminade or other where, where, where people who are doing this work are talking to talking about the problems they're facing. And they don't necessarily agree with me on all these issues. Right? I mean, there's, this, is, this is a field that's evolving quickly and a lot of discussions happening. Um, and most, most of the useful stuff is actually happening, if it happens at conferences, it's happening in the hallways where the, where the, where the practitioners are talking with each other. Certainly, and I think that's really important to plug into those conversations and certainly capture some of that incredible knowledge. So it seems that, that uh, there are no further questions that, that we can tackle, tackle. I do have one that's uh, on, my, on my own. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and ask that away. In terms of uh, one of the points that you mentioned is that there is really a lot of value uh, regarding convincing customers, uh, convincing customers of value, that it's really important. In your experience with Luminar, what have been some of the successful tactics in, in doing that kind of education and that kind of marketing, if you will? Well, the, it's really about showing people, right? Um, Poor people have been oversold stuff many times. I mean, the village we're working in in Peru has had several people come in in the past and promise them some form of energy. Um, they often end up spending a lot of energy, a lot of time, and a lot of their, their hope on getting something, and then you know the NGO runs out of budget, or the the student goes back to their host country, or whatever. So, I mean, really, it's about um, first of all building a track record, and and you know because. Obviously, people in one village talk to people in other villages to see where it works. But also, mm -hmm. in, for example, in Peru, we, you know, we're, we're doing four or five houses without any money changing hands to prove the system works. Then when the system mm -hmm. works, they know what they're getting. They know what they're paying for. And we're not asking them for any money up front, which is the advantage of a, of a pay-as-you-go pay system. Um, so you know, once systems are working, then people are willing to pay. But you know, just because it only costs a couple of dollars a day, that's their energy budget. If they spent it on you, they can't spend it on anything else. So they better be sure that what you're going to deliver them is actually going to be better than what they're currently getting from candles and kerosene. Absolutely, that proof of concept. Very critical. Right. And, and there's, you know, there's been a lot of cases where you know, junk stuff's appeared on the market and has cleared the market for everybody. Um, I, uh, Martin Fisher from Kickstart, who was a... Um, you know, one of the pioneers in this space was talking about introducing pumps in Kenya. It all went fine because they were the first on the ground. When they tried to introduce, I think it was in Malawi, someone had already been there. It was a government program. It had put some really terrible pumps in. The pumps had all failed. So now, even when they came in with good pumps, people weren't willing to buy them because, uh, you know, the, the, the word on the street was kettle pumps are bad news. Absolutely. It's that credibility that was lost. So to be very careful when we install these things because the, the, the spillover effects and other organizations coming in after us is, is tremendous. Uh, one more question that's come in. It's really interesting. Okay. Uh, one thing I would is add to that is the other thing uh -huh. that can clear the, clear the space for stuff that scales is when people go in and don't fully cost stuff. So if, if systems are installed at a price which takes account of the fact that all the labor is voluntary, 
then that, that may stop people who are actually having to pay for their labor coming in and doing the rest of the village. Right. Uh, one question. Some, yes. Uh, one question that's come in uh, from a listener in Indonesia: Is there any way I can access a complete DIY project of building these wind turbines or solar panels online? Uh, in in Indonesia, this technology is very expensive and in the unavailable in remote areas. Um, I don't. I believe that the that the wind turbines that our partner uses at WindAid were developed based on the Hugh Piggott design. Um, I've seen people building those. The chances of building them from the plans are very low, um, but there are people who, do, who train you in how to do it. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, keep in mind that you can reach out to Mitra at uh, the email address listed here. So if you have some specific questions that we can't tackle, he can certainly address them. Um, someone sent a question that's a little bit more administrative uh, regarding uh, the slide deck and a link to it. There's going to be a recording of this webinar available on E4C's YouTube channel as well as on our webinars page. Uh, give us a couple of days and, and we'll get that processed and up and ready for you so everything will be available. All of our webinars are recorded and available free of charge after the fact. Um, we're coming towards the end, uh, and I'd really like to thank you again, uh, Mitra, for your time. There is uh, just one little note. Uh, we, we did note that you have your, the best solar collector, as you mentioned, uh, right on top of your head. And someone <laughs> mentioned that, uh, that well, someone was curious about how often you have to shave your head to get it that shiny. So uh, <laughs> you get daily compliments. When problem when there's, daily when there's a problem, this is a problem when there's no electricity. <laughs> very good way of, of looping us back into the subject at hand. So I'd like to thank everybody today for attending this webinar. Again, the information about upcoming webinars and recordings is available at our website listed here. For those of you who are looking to get a professional development hour for participating in this webinar, please uh, email eab-ceuadmin at IEEE.org with the code that is listed on the slide you see right now. If you have any more questions, please do email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org or send an email directly to Mitra. And don't forget to become an E4C member to get information on upcoming webinars. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. And, oh, as I see there's more questions, but uh, we're going to have to tackle them offline. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great day, morning, evening, wherever you may be. And we will speak again with all of you soon.